Right, um, we're going to do some questions now, because I'm sure when I say, has anybody got any questions, loads of hands will go up. Um, Sharon, can you grab the, um, the other microphone? It's a wandering sort of mic, so speak clearly into it if you could. I just wanted to find out if there's a difference um, in the testing from the biopsy uh, that can be done using the fine needle aspiration and a biopsy post-operation when you have potentially... Um, you're just resected. I don't think there is a difference, but... Um. Um, with a fine needle aspiration, depends how much you get in the terms of cells and whether they have enough to send over. With the operation, providing they haven't had treatment beforehand, then it should make a difference. Occasionally, if you've got a lot of dead tissue from the treatment beforehand, that can affect cells, but... If you've got active cells, I think you should be okay. So would you... Um, I'm on, sorry, I'm on neoadjuvant imatinib um, prior to um, the operation. Will they do a molecular test, um, I'm hoping, when they remove um, the remainder of the tumour? Or I've been uh, told that I have a kit um, 11 exon mutation. So it's, it's been done already. So it's been done. It's been done. That's a box ticked. Thank you. If they found it in the fine needle aspiration, it's it's going to be there in the whole tumour. Um, if um, somebody is waiting for surgery, they've got a tumour, is it best to refer to a specialist centre before surgery or is it okay to have the surgery done locally and then get a referral? Uh, got to be careful how you answer these, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Personally, I think it should go to a specialist that is used to operating on these. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, a sarcoma surgeon doing it, but it needs, in most cases, it will be an upper GI surgeon, but who is used to or recognising the region as doing the GIST resections. So the short answer to that is yes to a specialist surgeon. Um, the reason being that we want to be sure of the margins and things like rupture and things during surgery as well. On, on that, my personal experience, I was treated in, in Bath, which isn't recognised as a specialist centre or wasn't then. And um, as we know, the tumour grows in the lining. Uh, for me, it was in the lining of the stomach. Um, when they first did a, uh, uh, an endoscopy, they thought my tumour was about two centimetres in size. So they decided on surgery to try and remove it, and my wife was told it would be about three hours. I was nine hours in surgery, and I looked like I'd been stabbed four or five times and then slit up the middle, because they tried to do it with keyhole surgery, then realised they couldn't get the tumour out, because the majority of the eight centimetre tumour was on the outside of the stomach. So they had to turn it into a full open me up. So it's another reason why it's very important to ensure that your su the surgeon that's dealing with you is a specialist in, in GIST. Okay. Um, do I just speak into it like that? I just wanted to say thank you so much for all the hard work that you're doing in terms of categorising and collating data. I think it is so important that we do learn about what's happened to us. So when I was first um, diagnosed as potentially GIST, I did so much research online. And I think that it was really important for me to do that because I had a surgeon telling me that this was not a risk. It was not cancer. He was quite angry with me. And he wanted to perform a biopsy, and I said no, because I'd read up about how friable gists are and how that can potentially seed. So I felt, I feel that it's really important for us all to arm ourselves with as much knowledge as we possibly can in order to affect outcomes, but also to help the medical community, because this chap wasn't being unkind, he was just simply a surgeon who's ignorant of the implications of what he was dealing with. So I was referred to a specialist centre and even that surgeon said, this won't be a problem, it won't, be, it won't come back. But then the mutational analysis was done and it came back as high risk. 
So that was a bit of a shock. So I did more research into what you were talking about with the um, mutations in exon 11. And I went even a bit deeper into the codons and the 558, 559 being potentially more risky, um, VAL 5, uh, sorry, 557, 558. And I wondered if what the future is in terms of this mutational and genetic analysis, because I even discovered that potentially if you have alleles, like one allele, it's less risky, a, a, a heterozygous than a, ho a, ho a homozygous. Um, so even if you've got a low risk tumor that's under a certain size and the mitotic count is under, under five, if that is homozygous, it can be more aggressive so some patients are possibly being told that their tumor is not potentially a problem, although now they're more diagnosed, you know, risk assessed as risky. But even that, within the, down to the detail of the alleles is important. And I wondered what the future was in terms of looking into that as well. Um, so in, in the cancer registry, we are collecting the exact mutation that's there. If the lab tells us the exact mutation, um, so, so the, the code on that, sorry, I don't know your name. Oh, I don't want to say it. Okay. The code on that, th this lady was talking about code on, so what a code on is, is it's a collection of three letters in the DNA. Um, so we can record, you know, which of those are mutated. We can record which one letter of the DNA is mutated. So over time, what we will do is, um, you know, build up a really detailed list of what the mutations are in GISTs. And because we're linking that within the National Cancer Registry, we can look at the treatment these people have had, we can look at outcomes, we can look at survival. Um, so as I say, we've only got um, four years worth of molecular data at the moment, and, and GIST is a rare tumour. But over time, this data is only going to build up, and we can start doing some of those um, correlations and, and um, you know, seeing, seeing what the difference is that these mutations make. But yes, we are recording the mutations in very, very granular detail. And no other cancer registry in the world is doing that. <laughs> it's just occurred to me that we need to be marketing ourselves, so come this way. Stand with this in the background. <laughs> Looks better on camera, apparently. Okay, next question, Sharon, over here. Hi, um, I'm Vicky. I have a quite tricky question, but I'd kind of like a scientific answer rather than an emotive answer, if that's possible. So I am wild type. I have discovered it's in my genes, um, so it's something I inherited. And I have two sons who are now 19 and 16, fully aware of it. They've grown up with this then. And obviously they are now interested in potentially getting tested. From a scientific point of view, is, it, is the science community interested in that information? Um, because obviously, you know, they may have it in their genes, but as I understand it from the genetic counseling I've had, there's only a 10% chance of them developing a gist, but obviously, you know, we, everything is changing because when I was originally diagnosed in 2007, I was told it was very unlikely to be genetic. But science moves forward, science learns, doesn't it? So from a scientific point of view, would you be wanting children to get tested or, or, or where somebody's inherited a gist, their, their children or as adults even, to get tested, will that information be useful going forward? Um, gosh, um, so so you're a really you know, rare individual then if you've inherited a tendency to, to just, and, and you mentioned that this can happen, didn't you, but it, it is very much in the minority. Is it is it a kit mutation? SDHB. SDHB. But I think from the inheritance, it's SDHA, I, I'm, Dr. Ali may understand more than I do, but um, yeah. Okay, um, so if, if this has been confirmed in your germline, as in what you've inherited, um, then both your boys would have a 
50-50 chance of inheriting that. You probably know that from the genetic counselling. Um, but yes, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will have a gist. Um, now, if they're 16 and 19, I'm not sure that they would offer the 16-year-old testing at the moment. I think mainly they, they want people to be over the age of 18. And obviously, that's a really personal decision for um, a person to make, you know, if they know they're at risk of an inherited cancer and they want the genetic testing, that's entirely up to them. Um, you know, eventually that, that <coughs> data would filter through to us in the cancer registry, yes, but that's not a reason for them to get tested, that, that they need to do what's right for them. Um, and hopefully you're getting some support from your genetic counsellor and they can as well to help them make those decisions. Um, but yeah, hopefully some... Do you know anything about screening that's available for people in that situation? Officially there isn't screening. Uh, it's an interesting question because scientifically, yes, it is useful information. Um, and then what do you do with that information? Because there isn't formal screening for GIST, but it, it's the awareness, isn't it? And, and being more aware that a so-called vague symptom might be related to something else, because 10%, yes, isn't high, but, but it's still 10%. Um, so so th there's no formal screening, but it might be useful for awareness, I think. Um, believe it or not, I've been told at 16 they can make that decision for themselves, so they can be referred for genetic counselling. Whether they would test them or not, I don't know at that age, but I've been told it's, it's for him to make that decision even at 16. They, at that age, they, because it's to do with your health, you can make that decision. Um, but whether they would test them or not, I don't know, but yeah. It, it strikes me that it, it's, a, it's a driver for the likelihood as well, because the more statistics you have about whether somebody who's genetically more likely to get a GIST actually gets one, if we have a build-up of data about that, that will be a driver for prediction and therefore a driver for finding out you know, what, what turned the, the switch on um, and therefore treatments. So it's, it's important. It is an important part of this. And the smaller the GIST, hmm. Yeah, exactly. Really yeah. Really so if the statistics over time say that there is a greater than 10%, 20 whatever the, the percent chance is, then just like we're all tested, the people that have had a GIST are tested to see if it's come back, if it's been fully resected. The same for somebody genetically more likely to have one. If there are symptoms, as you, I think you just alluded to, then those symptoms will drive a diagnostic test to say, whether it is or isn't a gist, and um, you know, in, in, the, in that circumstance, that that will save the NHS money because it will get them treated sooner. So it's a very important question, and yeah, um, I'm I'm going to put my Cancer 52 hat on and take that back to um, the powers that be. Thank you, <laughs> Sharon. Just gen this gentleman here. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Cheers, thank you very much. There's been a lot of uh, hike in the media lately about um, molecule research so, you know, and obviously um, infecting tumour in order to kill the tumour. Now, is there any possibility that this guess can be cured by this new technology? <laughs> um, simply possibly <laughs> um, a lot of it is sort of immune mediated and we we've had a bit of a lack of immune mediated treatments in in soft tissue tumors generally um, but as we learn more about you know the different sort of causes for the different subtypes of GIS there potentially might be I don't see it as something happening quickly but you do see the odd cases you know elsewhere in the world where they've used it in a particular abnormal cellular level pathology and things. So I think potentially it might be, but 
possibly not early on. Because we, th a lot of the immune type treatments are based on um, abnormal proteins that, that are targeted by the immune therapy. And you have to ensure you have that pathway or protein there. And it's whether we discover ones that we can target. And I think that's really it. So whether we'll eventually get to target the ones we've got at the moment, possibly. Sorry about this. <laughs> right. What it is, is it possible to get personal treatment? Like, you know, finding out your DNA, what makes your protein uh, attract, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, build tumour up, you know. I mean, I know the NHS is really standard for financial, but obviously, um, you know, is it possible to go private and, you know, get, you know, uh, I mean, I know UK is ahead of, you know, cancer, but obviously there's other countries which are more advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, like somebody wants a private treatment, is it possible to get private treatment? Um, it's always possible to get private treatment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, but whether private treatment's the right thing is, is always yeah, a difficult Because obviously what, what you got is uh, basically where you can... If you get your DNA yeah. and then you know if you can just track the tumour and then find other molecules or find out all the nucleus or what's yeah. triggering the... Uh so, d I don't know if you're aware, but at the moment there's um, uh, genomic sequencing done for... Essentially you can do it for all soft tissue tumours and a number of other tumours. And, and there are private companies that used to do it as well, where you do a full genomic screen. And what that does is it identifies any gene abnormalities, some of which may be targetable and some may not. The role for it is unclear because we don't always have treatments that will target it. Um, there are sometimes early phase trials that will use drugs that might target it and that's where it may be useful. Um, but wh what I would say is you need to just be a bit cautious with early phase trials because the reason they're called early phase trials is because we don't know what, what, what they'll do. And if there are standard treatments you know beforehand, I would advise you go down that route and go down the trial route. Now, you're right, abroad you probably will find private institutions that will offer such and such, and such to target this you know, change in your gene sequence. And you, c you can pay for it. Will it work? No one knows. Um, and my, my personal view would be, you know, do it in the context where it's controlled under trials. I don't know if you feel any different. Um, yeah, I think there is a, a lot of hype about whole genome sequencing. There's a lot of excitement about it. Um, and yes, it can have a role, but I, I think at the moment the better answers are coming from more targeted testing of specific genes that we know go wrong in specific tumours and the key thing is where we know we have targeted therapies um, because you might know your whole genome sequence but what are you going to do about it mm. um, and if, if you, know, you find out your tumour's got this weird and wonderful mutation in a really obscure gene mm. but there's no drugs that are targeting that obscure gene it's just information and you can't do anything with it so I, th I think you know there's excitement there for a good reason but it does need to be tempered with a lot of caution you know there is a limit to what whole genome sequencing can tell us thank you uh, I have some information about genome sequencing as well so um, I won't say a name, but I'm very good friends with one of our new secretaries of state, and she enabled me to go to some of the leadership hustings, um, and I was able to ask some questions, one of which was about rare and less common cancers generally, and both the candidates, and obviously we know who the, who the winner and our current prime minister is, they confirmed, and this is publicly in an audience, that genome sequencing exactly as you have just said, they, I was impressed with how much they knew about it actually, that it, it's, first of all, there is a commitment from this government to ensure that genome sequencing is put at the forefront of the, the medical advances that we're doing in order to find out what's going on within cancer, but also to go beyond what genome sequencing, genomic sequencing can do in the short term and really make use of it. And I think that's what you're alluding to is 
what just having genome sequencing is fine, but we need to know where that's going to lead to. So the conversation or the answer that came back to me was very much about um, moving it forward from just genome sequencing because there's hype about it and it's very good, but we need it needs to have its specific purpose. So you know that it was good that that. Uh, we're, we're able as the general public to ask a question like that and get an answer that f for me and for everybody here and everybody else in the cancer community it was a positive answer so um, I'll be holding her to that <laughs> as well <laughs> so another question yep in the back Sharon oh sorry uh, and then at the back here I recently uh, read a paper from uh, China I think it was 2020 and it was looking at whether patients had homozygous or heterozygous uh, aberrations in the, in the uh, KIT-11. And it was extremely predictive, according to their data, um, to um, uh, the risk stratification, if you understand me. Uh, and I just wonder whether you're doing any uh, work on that in this country at all. Um, I don't know. I haven't um, read that particular paper. Um, I, I think the, the homozygous mutations would be a lot, lot, lot rarer. Um, but I, I honestly don't know enough about them to be able to comment anything useful on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that we have the numbers. That when I, I'm not aware of anyone looking at that specifically at the moment. Hi. Um, sorry about that. Recently, I had, um, well, last October, I had my tumour removed, and uh, I thought I'd wait till after that had been done before I decided to do my DNA to have it tested on my family tree. And I was wondering if uh, things like GIST or any sort of cancers, can't they connect with DNA uh, testing centres to see if it uh, because I would happily volunteer for it to be used for research, you know, to see if anything could be seen on people's DNA, like hereditary um, gist or any form of cancer. Can't research be done from DNA? Are, are you talking here about the, the DNA you've inherited or about the, the mutations specifically in the tumour? With, with anything, really, because like you said, it can be hereditary, but we're not going to know if it's in your tree unless you're tested. And because we're not always being helped by our doctors. I know uh, a lot of people experience, because even mine, I was told for years I'd got indigestion. And I had to literally say, I do not have indigestion. I, I have something wrong. And for years I wasn't listened to. So, and I know that um, a lot of gist are found when something else is being looked at. And it shouldn't be done like that. We should be listened to. And we're not being listened to. We're actually treated as, um, the, in fact, they even want to remove us from their doctor's list. That's how we're treated. So at least if something was done to actually connect with the DNA research, that would help in many cancers. Because you know we know what we talked about. We know our bodies. But if so, something was done to test through DNA, that would be handy and probably save lives. So are you, are you saying that your feelings are that if DNA was done and there was a DNA connection in the past through, through the family and the GP knew about that, then he would treat your situation as a potential, let's say, gist? Is that, no, is that if, no, if we, we actually knew, because we appear to be knowing a lot of things about things even before our doctors. We know that we've got something wrong with we, we gist or whatever it may be. The doctors are not listening to us, whereas if we've got the facts saying, yes, we've got the evidence, then they'll have to listen. Yeah, but they would need that evidence as well, wouldn't they? Um, so I think, unfortunately, this is a very common problem with um, a lot of rare conditions across the board. Um, you know, with a lot of rare diseases, we hear about the diagnostic odyssey and people having to go from pillar to post and it taking a long time. There have been huge um, delays in diagnosis and people do feel like they're talking to brick walls. So I'm really sorry you've had that experience. Um, 
I don't know if it makes it better or worse if I say that that is a very common experience amongst people with rare conditions. I think that probably makes it worse, but you're certainly not alone. Um, I mean, I, th I think, yeah, the DNA is always really important for research. And um, I think if you have a rare condition and, um, you know, if, if it's sort of validated by a genetic test, that, that does bring a lot of... Um, well, it's sort of internal validation, isn't it? You know, see, I knew there was something wrong, and here the, the DNA proves it. Um, but a, again, it's it's the resources involved in, you know, getting that done. Um, and genome sequencing is not straightforward, unfortunately. And um, you know, you can test somebody's genes, and sometimes you'll get a really definitive answer: this gene is fine, this gene is problematic, but more often than not, you'll get an answer, well, there's, there's, there is a sequence change in this gene, but we don't know whether this is an important sequence change or not. And those are called variants of unknown significance, and they can throw up a lot more questions than they answer. So unfortunately, the science is not black and white. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all helpful, but I'm, I'm just really sorry that you've had that experience. So part of that experience that you had um, is in general terms called he uh, the health inequalities. So the inequalities of health across the country, whether that's regional inequalities or any other inequalities. Now, you may or may not heard that there is a white paper about health inequalities that is supposed to have gone forward to Parliament to potentially been passed as an act that covered everything to do with inequalities and why there are inequalities and what the NHS, the government, NHS are going to do about the inequalities. Um, this is going to sound like I've been, but I'll just say it. So I had a roundtable discussion with um, Therese Coffey last week where we discussed the health inequalities white paper and the fact that it had been sh apparently shelved. You've probably heard about this yourselves, have you? But the fact that it had been shelved. So we, wanted, we wanted to know why, because it just seemed that that was the way to try and solve the sort of problems that you're looking at. The reason was that she told us was that it's not been shelved, it's still in her inbox, she's only been in the job for three weeks, and it's one of her priorities to get looked at. So we are now optimistic that the, that health inequalities white paper will eventually, sometime soon, move forward. And again, you know, with the, with the Cancer 52 hat on, and, w and GIST cancer is a representative of Cancer 52 as well. We, they represent us. So, you know, it, this, is, this is all part of the mechanism of cancer charities to try and hold the government to account on things like this. So, again, it's something that we'll be following up, we'll be chasing, and we'll be reporting back through our forums as and when we know the information. So, any other questions? Over here. Thank you. Um, an oncologist told me three years ago there's a great deal of ignorance about um, gists in the medical profession. Now, when I had my operation and was recovering from it, fortunately it was a university hospital, so they had second year medical students coming round, and some with, somebody with a little bit of foresight said, they don't know about gists, mention gists to them. So I got them for 10 minutes. And they went away wiser than the majority of doctors because I've been in, I've been, um, in other situations. I went in one with a side effect and I showed the card, the gist card, and the doctor looked at it and said, gist what? And I think if you get it at the education stage, the university stage, I think we can get across the message a great deal better. Okay, I, absolutely. <laughs> so, so the, what you've just said um, is something that's been on our agenda as Just Cancer UK for a while. And, and Jane Bressington, um, along with other trustees, uh, have with Ramesh, Belusu, Robin Jones, formulate, and a, another GP, and forgive me, I don't remember her name, from Gloucester, she sort of 
um, spearheaded this, have produced a GP video that we are trying to get accepted by the General Medical Council to go into uh, the GPD, GP's CPD, Continued Professional Development, so that they can see what a GIST is, what to look for, basically become more educated. Furthermore, we're looking to try and get that put into universities, medical universities, so that at an, a really early stage, they can start to look at a video that tells them specifically about GIST. We have to bear in mind that there are over 200, you might have a better number, a more precise figure, of rare and less common cancers. And I doubt we're the only charity that's, that's doing this. So, but GPs sign up to the fact that they need to be a font of knowledge. But we also need to recognise, and I don't know if anybody sat in their surgery when a, the, the GP Googles something, that happens. What we want them to do is when they Google some symptoms, that it pings up our GP video, for example. So you're right in what you say, and, and we as a charity are doing our best to try and improve that education. But also nationally, from a cancer perspective, there's something called the National Cancer Programme by David Fitzgerald and Dame Callie Palmer. I don't know if you know about this either, but they also have been tasked specifically to improve outcomes for cancer sufferers. And that includes um, GP education. So it's a very important point. Um, we're doing what we can, our bit, to help with that as well. Google GIST, you find the logistics firm in Scotland <laughs> just being taken over by the MS. We, we asked them if they'd like to sponsor us. And they said they, they didn't they want to be no. associated with the cancer. <laughs> Can't blame them, I suppose. But yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, so, so what I would say is, um, <laughs> oh, right. First of all, what I would say is Google GIST cancer. That'll, that'll help. And number two, Everybody in this room, at the back of the room, there's information about just the specific posters that you can take to your surgery, you can take to your hospitals. You can be part of this network of educating people. So take this information to your local GP, to your local hospital, and tell them about it. My local hospital has a, um, a, a, a selection of pamphlets about GIST in it. If we all do that to all our hospitals, even if somebody else has already done it in your hospital, at least you can make sure that your information is is, is put there. So um, help yourself to the information at the back. Any any other questions? Oh, hang on. Before, sorry, sorry. Did you want to add anything to what I've just said? No. no. no? Okay. Um, I it's not so much a question. It's just I wanted to respond to. A the lady earlier, but it's, and you've you've kind of covered that as well, in that there is inequality, I think, across Britain in terms of the provision, because my doctor saved my life, because I went with menopausal symptoms, and she had a hunch, and she sent me for a scan, and if she hadn't done that, I wouldn't even be sitting here today, I'd be in sweet oblivion while that thing grew and became more of a problem. So... You know, I can't praise the NHS enough for that. And even my doctor, the other, because I see different doctors when I go to the surgery, he, when he called me in after the scan had been looked at, he openly said, I don't know anything about GISTs. I've had to Google it. But he was willing to Google it, and he was willing to send me to a specialist centre. And, and I think it's so important what you're doing in terms of raising awareness with the people who actually can do something in a widespread way rather than locally me putting a poster in the my GP surgery which of course I have done and I will continue to raise awareness but at that level that you were saying about where get them when they're at college and information is all and that and so I think what you know this and what you're doing is brilliant uh, so thank okay. you okay. so um, thank you for that um, you just used the word your doctor had a hunch same with me. My doctor had a hunch, and he sent me to, uh, to somewhere to have a, a, a diagnostic test, a, an endoscopy. So in the last 10 years, uh, the government has uh, formulated a plan to ensure that when a GP, and, and it's not finished yet, but when a GP has a hunch, uh, and it, it's more than just a hunch. They, they normally have the medical 
background of the person. So it's it's you know it's something they look at the symptoms and think mm, it could be, rather than looking at all the obvious things that it could be, where you get given a meprazole because you've got a stomach ache, for example. There's been a formulation of what they call what was called rapid diagnostic centres. They're now called, and I found this out last week, community diagnostic centres. You probably have some of those within this area as well. They are reasonably new, but there's a commitment from the government to put money into having these rapid diagnostic centres. So what that means is, rather than when your doctor sees that you've got a problem, you get put into the NHS system whereby it's in a hospital, there are, uh, there are specific centres that have a whole host of rapid diagnostic uh, machinery, CT scanners, um, uh, MRI scanners, um, endoscopies, colonoscopies, and the doctor can short circuit going to the, the NHS and put you into one of these rapid diagnostic centres. Now that is something that I believe we need to, you know, accelerate the existence of these because, yeah, um, pri privately always can can get you, but the vast majority of us haven't got private health, so we have to think about, you know, from a from a an NHS perspective. So that that those those mini hospitals, if you like, are a, an important part of getting diagnosed sooner. D did you want to add anything to that? I think um, m many, if not all, cancer alliances, the networks um, in the UK have got a certain amount of funding to develop rapid diagnostic services. Um, so I, I, I think they are trying to utilise them appropriately, that they are speed, speeding it through. Um, certainly we're, we're doing it here with um, my involvements are in the soft tissue tumours and the teenagers and young adults, so all of those are using it. So I think they're, 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 it is being addressed, but it's actually guiding it in the right way. Okay, question over here. Actually, if we go um, over here first, then back to Judith. I can't ignore Judith, she'll have a right go at me. <laughs> the lady in green. I believe, can you hear me? Yep, speak up. I believe that I was um, benefited from the rapid diagnostic. Mine was complicated by being slap bang in the middle of lockdown. Mm. So um, initially I had probably, I was lucky I went in with um, it lacking in iron and whatever, that, what, what's that called? That's it. And my doctor sent me in for tests. The tests then including endoscopies and, and colonoscopies, they, but they were done in two hospitals which were linked. One test was done in one, one test was done in the other. Middle of lockdown, one of the tests never got read. And I'm thinking, oh, this is good, you know, nothing's happening, whatever, better check. My doctor saved my life, my GP, because he was able to fast track, could see the endoscopy um, x-ray thing, and could see what, what he could see. And then I was fast-tracked immediately um, because it had gone on for three months between that original thing and I was fast-tracked. And it saved. in the meantime, my tumour had grown to a very high risk size and mitotic rate anyway. But he saved my life because he interfered and he interfered in the right way. So he, I was very lucky. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess the, the whole point of this is to increase the numbers of you, <laughs> you know, getting, getting looked at sooner, because we all know the outcome for cancer is much better if you can be diagnosed and treated sooner. Judith. This isn't a question, it's a comment really, that we've been talking a lot about risk factors and the fact that the size, the mitotic rate, the location, and the mutation affect the risk of it coming back. I think when you look at those graphs, they're scary. But you have to remember they're only statistics. And quite a lot of us who are off the top of the scale risk-wise are still here 20 years later. I think you're absolutely right. They are statistics and people aren't statistics. Um, and a lot of trials pick 
you know, who is eligible for a trial and it may not pick sort of people who are slightly outside. Um, but I think that's an even more important reason why they should be focused in with specialists who are seeing all these long-term survivors. What, what's happened with one person that's succeeded and use that on other people? And as I said, thinking outside of the box sometimes. Judith, what you're trying to do there, I think, is to give everybody more hope, aren't you? So those that have been to um, these things before, uh, these conferences before, will have heard me use the phrase PMA, positive mental attitude. Um, that's what I go by, being positive about the, the outcomes. You know, a glass half full, I think, is the phrase, isn't it? So I would encourage everybody to be positive about the situation you're in, do the research, use specialist centres, and there's a good chance you'll have a very positive outcome for it. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, just that, yeah, positivity is a really good thing, but don't let that spill over into toxic positivity. So, um, you know, I, you can be in the situation where, you know, things are just shit. <laughs> and um, and um, people are saying to you, oh, just have a positive mental attitude. It will all be fine. Sometimes it's not fine and that's not your fault. But, um, yeah, you probably need a positive mental attitude to get through it all because um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough road. Um, but, you know, there are lots of treatment options for GISTs and, um, the yeah, people are not statistics. And um, my, my uncle had cancer of the esophagus back in 1998. A few years later, I started my... PhD on cancer of the esophagus and I was horrified when I read that the five year survival rate was only about 8% but he was one of that 8% and he's still going strong today so yeah there are exceptions to every rule and whatever the statistics are you know somebody's got to be in that, that, that good outcome so yeah positivity great but no toxic positivity Isn't it nice to hear s s some of our medical professionals that can resonate and understand how we feel and be be really blunt about it, which is good, you know, say it as it is. Any other questions? Oh, Sharon must have gone to sort lunch out. That's a good sign. Um, just following on from um, the statistics about the survival rates, do they take into consideration the people who don't survive is that because of the gist, or could it be pneumonia or heart attack or something unrelated? Just death, you know, just getting just old. Death, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that the um, the survival rates are yeah, they're they're, they're all cause mortality. Um, I think there may be some stats on. I mean, sometimes it's a really grey area, isn't it? Did somebody die from their cancer or with it? But I think normally we look at all-cause mortality and we tend to sort of compare the, the population level of mortality um, with the specific level of mortality for people with a certain tumour. Um, but I'm not 100% sure because I don't deal with the statistics side of things, just with the molecular biology. I've got some very clever maths colleagues who do the statistics. Judith, I've known you 15 years, and uh, you haven't grown old at all. <laughs> you haven't changed a bit since I first met you. Did you want to add anything? Um, in terms of the stats, um, there, there are some trials which look at all-cause mortality and disease-related mortality, but it becomes more difficult when it's longer term because other things happen. And I think GIST is a good example in terms of not necessarily the figures, but a lot of patients do really well and are on imatinib for years and years and years. And just after what you said, I've got to be careful. Some patients get more mature in age um, and other things happen and they're still on treatment for their GIST. And it's, it's what goes on certificates and things like that as well, which does influence some of the statistics as well. Any more questions at the back left, Judith? Hi. Nice um, and close. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just wondering, um, doctors always say, oh no, that's separate, that's separate, that's separate. But about probably 10 years before I was diagnosed with GIST, um, I was told that I had a smooth muscle virus. And obviously with GIST being smooth muscle, I wondered if there was any known connections there. And then more recently, um, I had a rheumatic condition, enthesitis, which apparently is also smooth, the, the ends of the smooth muscle where they meet the bones. Is there any potential connection? But probably not, probably right. not. Um, the, the, the smooth muscle link with, with GIST is more to do with, um, do you remember that slide I showed with the pathology specimens to do with those spindle cells which appear on smooth muscles, but you can see that in normal cells as well, and things like information at end of smooth muscles, etc., are probably different. Now you can, from treatment, get other effects like that as well, um, so inflammatory type effects from being on treatments of different sorts, but from the actual gist it's unlikely to be linked in. Thank you. Oh. Um, I've got a quick question. Is there any evidence that imatinib is um, toxic, cytotoxic rather than static? Is there evidence that it kills the cells rather than just immobilizes them for a period of time? Um, Thank you. So usually when we use those terms, we apply it to chemotherapy. Um, and, and there's a good reason for that because the way chemotherapy works is different to how imatinib works. Um, it depends how you define it. Now, it's from the point of view of imatinib blocking off the, the growth of the cells and then they're, they're dying off through their natural process more quickly, they, they, they are sidal. But we do also know that patients with metastatic gist who've been on imatinib and stop it do can get flares of their disease and and that would suggest that there is an element of it being static as well so although it's killing off the the active cells it's probably not completely killing them off in, in the vast majority of cases and and that's why most people need to be on imagining for long term I just came in on a conversation about rheumatic something no yeah yeah, it was interesting because my, when my gist was removed, they, I have rheumatoid arthritis, and they removed a drug from me which they suspected caused the tumour, and that drug was called Humira. Um, so some drugs will create tumours, presumably. Yeah, it can precipitate yeah, it. Yeah, can yeah. precipitate it, yeah. Um, any more questions? Oh. Thank you. Uh, I think this will be to Dr. Ali, and it's regarding taking a matinib. Um, I had a gist tumor removed last year. Uh, I've been on a matinib since September last year. But hopefully before the end of this year, I've got another operation to remove my prostate because I've got prostate cancer. Is there a recommended, I know I'm gonna to have to come off imatinib when I have the operation, is there a recommended time to be off the imatinib for, or is there a set time when I need to go back on the imatinib after the operation? Um, that, that's a really good question. Um, different people have different views on it because it's not a set fixed time, but what I tend to say is four or five days beforehand and four or five days afterwards is usually enough. Sometimes the surgeons are concerned about the healing time because imatinib can slow down healing, in which case you can go up to two weeks if they need to, but usually four or five days before and four or five days after for something like a prostate surgery should be enough because um, you, you don't want to be off it too long. And I think uh, some people get a bit confused because they confuse imatinib with chemotherapy and they think of what chemotherapy can do to wound healing. And, and that needs a much longer period of time of recovery. But imatinib shouldn't need as long. Sharon, I think you were indicating lunch is soon, were you? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Are, th are there any more questions?
There's plenty of time to ask questions during lunch. Um, we'll spread out, won't we? Um, okay, so quarter two, I'm told that the chef will be ready with our lunch. So if we can spend a bit of time having a chat, do this. Um, if we've got a couple of minutes, perhaps this oh, okay. is a point at which I yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. so Judith wants to talk to a us a little piece of research I've been doing. Some those of you who are on this serve will have got emails from me saying, please, if you've if you're taking imatinib in any of its new forms, please tell me about your side effects. I had forty four responses, very varied, and I think the thing it showed me most was that they were all different. And that some, I had one person say that they did far better on one of the new generics than they had on Gleevec. Um, but most people, a lot of people found that the new generic forms of imatinib were giving them side effects they hadn't had on Gleevec. So I created a list and I've got quite a lot of data from these 44 respondents. And I had a chat a couple of days ago with a pharmacist at the Marsden. And she was very interested in my data. And she said, we need to get together. We'll produce a questionnaire. And she's going to um, get through all the ethics committees and so on that she has to, all the hoops she has to jump, jump through. And she's then going to ask all her patients at the Marsden to complete this questionnaire that she and I have concocted. And she hopes then to get funding, possibly from us, who knows, um, to go national. Because the different generic forms of imatinib do seem to have different side effect profiles. And it would be very, very interesting to find out um, which is the best one to have. At the moment, we don't know, and the hospitals have to prescribe the cheapest one. That's the rule. And different companies are having different contracts with different hospitals. So it's a muddle at the moment, but we need to get some more information. So I hope in a few, probably months rather than weeks, you will probably be invited to complete a questionnaire, a much more detailed way of responding than mine, which was a pretty what, what have you had sort of thing. This will be a much more sought through um, and therefore validatable questionnaire. We should get some proper data. Um, I think Ramesh Balusu is wondering whether the generics actually work as well. I think they should, but one of the questions that occurs to me is if these new drugs or new formulations of imatinib are producing side effects that patients don't like, are they actually taking the pills? And if they're not, perhaps that's why they're not working. If you don't take the pills, they won't work. Right. So what, what, what we're doing there in, in, uh, with regard to what Judith is just saying is putting Judith's contacts uh, in touch with Ramesh mm. so that they can formulate this questionnaire that answers as many of those questions as simply as possible. Yeah. And, and as I say, we, we've offered our LISA forum um, in order to ask that question of patients. So, uh, so watch this space for that. So we are, we are affecting things. Great. Let's keep at it. So on that note, and I mentioned a credit card machine earlier, but I thought I'd better just clarify what it is we do. So. Those that don't know, this is pretty much everything that we do. Oh, it's just got louder. Um, we are all volunteers. We don't take any payment to do anything that we do with GIST. Um, and I would say I probably spend 40% of my time doing, doing cancer stuff, all voluntary. Um, I've spent 40% of my time doing work and 20% of my time trying to relax. So, And some of us spend more time than 40% doing this sort of stuff. So the, any money that is donated to us goes towards this that we're doing here today. Um, all the publications that you see at the back, our representation at these various bodies to try and push rare and less common cancers and GIST. Um, and probably equally as important is the research that 
we try to instigate. Now, that's more difficult than it sounds because we need to get researchers to want to do research into GIST. So we have a medical advisory board that's uh, made up of a number of specialists within GIST and they not only look at any applications that we have come to us for possible research grants, we also try and make suggestions and put it out to the research community about what we think they sh or they think should be looked into to being a research project. So we, we have funds uh, you know, that we've built up over, over time and research projects are very expensive. So it's not like cancer research has a multi-million pound income every year and, and therefore they can, they can put research you know, in, in, a, in a far easier way than we can. So any, any contributions that anybody makes to us whenever and wherever it is, is all used to help all of us in this room and that's what we'll try and continue to do as well. So anyway, it's lunchtime. So as I said, straight down the hall and uh, enjoy your lunch and we'll see you when you get back.